uh, I don't know if, yeah, I see, I see Nathan unmuted himself. So Nathan, do, do you have a few remarks to make? I just wanted to make a comment about the poster session. So the poster session will be just after the discussion. So as soon as the discussion finishes, we'll open the breakout room. So for the people presenting posters, you don't need to be co-host. Just be ready five minutes before we open the poster session. That's uh, yeah, so let's move to the last discussion of uh, week one. Let's learn if we should average or not average. I remind you, the last 30 minutes are informal and we are not going to be very strict on time. The first 20 minutes are totally up to Steve and Jan. And in particular, they decided, for example, in this session, to give the floor to, um, to Douglas Stanford, who uh, luckily can join us now. And uh, so I'll pass it over to, um, to Jan and Steve, who will uh, prepare us for the discussion to follow. I think we agree that I would start out and then Douglas will take over kind of Douglas and Steve kind of flipped and then uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion with everyone else. Perfect. And, uh... <clears throat> so I'll just uh, start. So uh, what I thought I would do is just mention a long list of questions. Um, like some of them are high level, so they're not like small technical questions, but many will be more high level questions. Um, I will also have no references whatsoever. You can always choose between trying to be complete or trying to be maximally incomplete. So I decided to be maximally incomplete also because Steve already gave a nice overview talk. Um, also, sometimes if you annoy and irritate people, uh, you stimulate more discussion. Um, so there will not be any references whatsoever. Uh, we already heard several talks about the subject. Um, so I'll just start off by uh, listing uh, many, many questions. Um, well, wormholes, um, obviously, as we have heard, they, they seem to spoil uh, factorization. This uh, is, is obviously an important issue. And, and one way out with this apparent lack of factorization uh, could be that gravitational theories are dual to ensemble averages, which immediately raises the question, what happened to good alt ages CFT? Luckily, we now know the answer because we just had a poll and 55% of string theorists say that gravity is not an ensemble. And I, I don't think there's any community in the world that's more democratic than string theorists. So uh, this settles it once and for all. And we could stop right here. But nevertheless, I'll continue for a bit and, and ask some more questions. And so I think one perspective I would like to make is that if we do these computations in low energy effective field theory, um, then uh, we get some partial information about the high energy sector of the theory. We get uh, low energy effective field theory in general, uh, knows about high energy uh, degrees of freedom, but only in some coarse grained or blurred way. And I don't think in ADS CFT, we know exactly how that high energy coarse graining slash blurring works because we're doing uh, a low energy effective gravitational theory and a low energy gravitational effective theory behaves quite differently from standard low energy effective field theory where we integrate out uh, high energy loops in all the massive fields and we know quite well what's going on. Um, so it may well be the case that uh, as far as low energy effective field theory goes, there is very little distinction between having a proper ensemble average, which is uh, sort of, say, written here as like, so that we average over, say, finite temperature density matrices. Uh, I see there's a lot of response to my little poll joke in the, in the chat, but I will try to ignore that. So... <laughs> um, um, there might, from a low energy point of view, be actually very little difference between uh, having some sort of ensemble averaging at high energies or having some sort of unknown coarse graining at high energies. So as far as low energy effective field theory goes, maybe it's very hard to distinguish an ensemble average where the averaging takes place at a very high energy so that it has very little impact on low energy effective field theory versus maybe some sort of coarse graining or state averaging. But we don't know. This is just a cartoon, this expression here. You should not take it too literally. Um, it is just meant to indicate that, that if we do some unknown form of blurring or coarse graining at high energies, and it could be 
because we take narrow energy bands and we do some unitary average over that narrow energy band. Uh, it could be that if from a low energy point of view, these are very indistinguishable from each other. And maybe all that we are learning is not that the theory is an ensemble average, but maybe what we're learning is that there is a very interesting notion of coarse graining going on. Um, and many aspects of wormholes and so on can actually be captured equally well by an ensemble average or by various suitable notions of coarse graining. For example, it's quite easy to invent uh, versions of coarse graining or state averages or whatever. And again, I emphasize we don't know how that precisely works in AUCFT. Um, there's a, it's very easy to come up with a situation where the expectation value of the product of two density matrices is not the product of two expectation values. Uh, so that the average of the square of anything is not equal to the square of the average. That is very easy to obtain. Um, and if you're agnostic about the type of averaging that we are doing at high energies, then maybe low and then maybe ensemble averaging and coarse graining are actually indistinguishable at low energies. Uh, so this is my first question. Is there actually a simple low energy diagnostic that distinguishes proper ensemble averaging from a suitable notion of coarse graining. Uh, we don't know what that coarse graining is. Maybe we, we're learning what that is, um, but that would be my first question. Can we distinguish these two things? One way to distinguish them is to just UV complete the theory and add more and more UV ingredients. And then eventually one expects one will see a difference between an ensemble average and a single unitary theory. Because if you go all the way into the UV, you can obviously tell whether or not you have an ensemble average or a single theory. But maybe at low energies, it's very hard to distinguish these two possibilities. And maybe this is the lesson that we're learning. And actually in both perspectives, wormholes compute statistical fluctuations or moments of relevant probability distributions. So with these wormholes, we will not see this individual red noise. This is a picture I stole from Steve Stark. Thank you, Steve, for that. Uh, this red noise here is uh, not detectable by wormholes, but we can compute the average amplitude of this noise and higher order moments of this noise using suitable wormhole configurations. Um, so in some sense, with all these wormholes and so on, we seem to be probing uh, moments of probability distributions, which could either be ensemble average probability distributions, or it could be a probability distributions that are coming from a suitable notion of coarse graining. Then, of course, there's a question, where actually does the noise come from in an individual instance of the theory? Uh, this presumably requires uh, individual microstates. So one could try to approach this, say, from a uh, microscopic matrix model like uh, Clifford was doing. Um, but if those microstates are not present in your low energy effective field theory, then you will also not be able to capture the noise. You might be able to see it if you have a complete UV completion, because clearly uh, in an complete UV completion, we should be able to see the noise, but maybe at low energies, all we see is some moments of it and not the individual noise. So the second question is, where does the noise come from? Uh, the third obvious question is, how is factorization restored? Uh, this is the other obvious question. Um, again, it might be that at low energies, one sees an apparent lack of factorization and that how factorization is restored depends, depends on the details of the UV completion. It's possible, maybe, that the wormhole that uh, you think spoils factorization is destabilized and no longer present. Maybe we should forbid it by some stringy exclusion type principle, but that would be an entirely novel principle, as Kristen was suggesting. It's possible that in the UV we find all the relevant fluctuations that restore factorization. And it's also possible that we do not restore factorization, and that would be compatible with having an ensemble average interpretation. So these are all logical possibilities that can happen in the UV. Um, we have seen many, we have heard several talks about uh, JT gravity in discussions. Uh, if you treat these JT theories as UV complete gravitational theories and not just as a low energy effective field theory, then they are remarkably described by, uh, by suitable matrix models. It's a beautiful exact duality. Um, now you could ask, what, what's a single SYK sample dual to, uh, or a single matrix, right? If we wanted to zoom in on the difference between ensembles and single unitary theories, it, it would be nice. But whether 
one could actually construct a more accurate dual description of these single instances. And the question is, can we do that? Is that a good question? In the three dimensions, um, we can also study all these wormholes. And uh, two questions that come to mind in three dimensions are the first question is like, what's the dual of pure D 3D gravity? So now we try to treat three-dimensional gravity as a UV complete theory. So we don't add all kinds of additional Kaluza Klein towers and so on. We just take it as a standalone theory. And then you can ask, what is the dual? Uh, and what do we even mean exactly by pure 3D gravity? Do we need to tweak it or modify it? Yeah. And another question maybe is, are there nice natural ensembles uh, of holographic 2D CFTs that one can average over? The most obvious families are things where you have lots of moduli and you average over moduli, but maybe there's a more natural thing or a more general thing that one can do. Um, then I have three questions in, I, I'm almost done, in uh, dimensions above three. Uh, first question is that uh, we see that um, this double cone seems to give a reasonable uh, explanation of the ramp in, uh, also in higher dimensions, up to all kinds of subtleties that Kristen mentioned. Uh, you can ask whether the very long time scales that one is uh, probing with the ramp is part of low energy effective field theory to begin with. Um, we also seem to see a general phenomenon that Euclidean wormhole solutions, when they exist, are always subleading. And uh, maybe there's a general argument that this must al always be the case. Uh, or maybe we find a counterexample, and it'd be great to know what the implications of a counterexample would be and what it would imply for a possible UV completion that one could have. And one can ask an obvious question, does it make sense to average n equals four super yang mills of, say, the complex coupling constant or do something else? Uh, take a small wave packet for like uh, the complex uh, coupling tau and see if you do a small average what that does to the dot theory. And then there's a few questions that connect to other discussion sessions, like to have like a meta discussion session. So the first question is, uh, can we connect it to the Swampland program? In other words, can we violate some of the Swampland conjectures if we do averages rather than single theories? I think most of the Swampland conjectures implicitly assume a single unitary UV completion to exist. And maybe we can relax some of those conditions if we assume the dual is an ensemble average. The second question um, is, is also how to test for unitarity in the dual of average theories. Can you distinguish uh, whether you average over families of unitary theories versus taking, uh, you know, uh, averaging over some unitary and some non-unitary theories? And how do you test for that? What would be the smoking gun computation? Uh, it's a great question whether there's actually a, a deep connection between all of this and the bootstrap program, because uh, wormholes seem to yield statistical information about the high energy sector of the theory. Uh, the bootstrap does that in, as well in some sense, like some rules, you know, give you some statistical information about the high energy sector. And it's, it's a great question whether there's a more precise connection to be made and whether you can, in fact, uh, say bootstrap averages of theories rather than individual theories. Um, there's an interesting question whether we understand the unitarity of the black hole evaporation process somehow. You could say that the fact that uh, SS dagger equals one, that, that means that SS dagger is something that does not fluctuate. Uh, and maybe because it does not fluctuate, it has like no variance. Maybe that is why uh, we, we should at least be able to verify that it's equal to the identity uh, with some low energy computation. So maybe things that do not fluctuate are accessible to low energy effective field theory and everything that fluctuates is not. But it's, it's a great question whether there's a deep lesson to be learned here. Um, I think it's also an interesting question. The ramp uh, seems to be related to say this double cone and so on. So the, this long range level repulsion seems to be accessible, but uh, the short range level repulsion, which is uh, you know quantified by the plateau, uh, you can ask whether there's a nice gravitational argument that's a universal feature as well. If we, if we believe the old statement that any quantum chaotic system should ultimately be described by random matrix theory, then uh, there should be some argument for universality of the plateau in holographic theories as well. And it would be great uh, you know, to know what that universality argument would be. And maybe for that, we need a, a gravitational uh, dual description uh, of the uh, Goldstone mode model that uh, Alex Altland and Julian Sonder wrote down. 
most of these factorization things have to do with Euclidean wormholes. Uh, there's an interesting question whether there's something new uh, to be learned from Lorentzian wormholes in all of this. I don't have um, anything more to say about that. And my final question is about the whole baby universe business. Um, and I think an interesting question is whether we can reliably establish or rule out that the baby universe and the soup selection picture is, is relevant in a full-fledged solution of string theory, like with matter fields and everything, or whether it's a, a feature that is uh, applicable to low energy topological examples and low dimensional topological examples, uh, but that at high, uh, you know, in a full-fledged theory, it actually is uh, hard to make precise. Uh, is there like a smoking gun computation that will either establish this or rule it out? Uh, I think that's a great question. And I've asked many questions and I'll uh, hand the floor over to Douglas. Let's thank Jan while uh, Douglas sets up the screen share. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks a lot to the organizers and to Steve Schenker for um, covering for me earlier this week. So, um, okay. So here's one possible take on gravity and wormholes and ensembles. Um, fine grain quantum data, by which I mean like energy levels, operator matrix elements, are very complicated um, with no simple description. But one can imagine a simple effective description where these quantities are drawn from random distributions. So mathematically, we replace mm -hmm. the pseudo randomness by the complexity of pseudo randomness by the simplicity of actual randomness. This idea kind of goes back to Wigner in thinking about atomic nuclei. So, um, maybe simple gravity, by simple gravity, I mean low energy effective field theory of gravity coupled to matter fields. Maybe that is such a theory describing a possibly fake ensemble of boundary theories with different fine grained quantum data. Um, in some special cases, like in pure dilaton gravity, um, both the bulk simple gravity theory and the boundary ensemble are separately well-defined and dual to each other. But more hey, hey. Um, it seems more likely that both the simple bulk theory and the um, putative boundary ensemble are probably incomplete. On the other hand, they seem to be fairly detailed, going beyond just random matrix universality and ETH statistics. And it's an interesting question to wonder how far they go. So, this is a little awkward because the rest of my talk has significant overlap with what Kristen discussed. So I'm just going to skip it to give us more time for discussion. And I'll just go to the end where I have a couple of questions um, relating to wormholes and ensembles. So this, this is the most important question by far, which is uh, what are we supposed to add to the simple gravity theory to get a specific boundary quantum system? N equals four superang mills or, or something like that. This, I think, is the most interesting question. Um, but here I want to emphasize that there's another secondary interesting question, uh, which is to wonder how detailed is this fictitious ensemble of theories that simple gravity seems to describe? Um, what is it trying to describe? What is the input to this theory? Uh, what is the output and how far does it go? OK, so I'll actually just stop there and leave more time for discussion. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. You are well within time. <laughs> you could. <laughs> well, you, the rest of my talk. I would like to hear what Douglas had to say. <laughs> could you go over your slides, Douglas? Um, OK, OK, OK. Um, OK. Um, OK, so, so let, let me just try to go through an example of this um, in the simple context of energy statistics. So, in ADS CFT, the thermal partition function of the boundary is represented by boundary condition, which is a circle of length beta. So here's the circle, and here's the quantity that that computes. It's the integral over energies of a Boltzmann weighted density of states. So for a real quantum system, rho of E is a sum of delta functions. And in gravity, the Euclidean black hole geometry can fill in this boundary condition, and it gives the leading gravitational answer for the density of states. So we fill in the circle with this geometry, and the result is this computation here, where this capital G means evaluation in a simple gravity description. And here we're going to try to interpret it as meaning an average over an ensemble. So here I'm drawing two dimensional 
bulk pictures, but it could be higher dimensional. So a question to ask is, is the ensemble defined by this capital G non-trivial? And a wormhole like this one here would tell us about the variance on the ensemble. So this connected correlator of these spectral densities. Okay, so this wormhole would formally be computing this quantity here. But there's actually no solution. Um, and the reason is that the wormhole wants to get long and narrow. Um, the boundary interpretation of the fact that there's no solution is that this function, this correlation of the densities is not growing with energy. So in this integral here, there's no saddle point. So we shouldn't really have expected there to be a solution. And it's actually super important that there's no solution because if there were a solution, analytic continuation to Lorentzian signature would give an eternal traversable wormhole with no interaction between the two sides and that would violate boundary causality. However, there are several ways to tweak this setup so that there is a classical solution. Here's, here's five. Um, you can couple the two sides. You can insert heavy operators on the two sides, but not couple them. You can put spatially varying sources on the boundary. You can put imaginary sources, or you can study this case where beta left plus beta right is equal to zero. And the boundary conditions in the last four of these cases remain factorized. So the wormhole, which now exists as a classical solution, seems to require an ensemble interpretation in each of these cases. So I'm just going to make a couple comments about this fifth case here. Okay, so we want to set beta left plus beta right to be zero, but we don't want either of them to be have negative real part. So what we can do is we can make one positive imaginary and one negative imaginary. And then what we're computing is this integral. Where we, I've replaced the Boltzmann factors by this weighting by these phases. So because the sum of these betas is zero, the pressure coming from the Boltzmann factors is absent. And that means that a classical solution, a classical wormhole solution can exist. Um, this is what's called the double cone. And it has a periodic direction in the bulk with a geodesic length that's proportional to T. That's not obvious, but it's true. Okay, so if T is small, then this periodic circle is, is short. And the an answer is UV sensitive because we can have bulk fields propagating around this short circle. They feel like they're very high temperature state. So we need a more complete theory for this region. On the other hand, for very large T, the matter fields are projected into the vacuum by this very, very long circle. And the calculation is controlled. Also separately, and this is, gets to a question Hiroshi was asking earlier, um, in this limit, random matrix universality predicts an answer for this quantity from the boundary perspective. And the wormhole reproduces this answer. Okay, but there's a third region, which I think is interesting for kind of intermediate values of T, where um, there are exponentially decaying corrections from matter loops that can wind around this circle. And this is a prediction that goes beyond RMT. So to summarize this example, the, this simple gravity theory is incomplete and the associated ensemble is incomplete, but it um, reproduces random matrix theory in the limit of universality, but also goes beyond it, has corrections beyond it. Okay, so that's all. I wanted to say on that, and now I'll really stop. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let's thank, uh, please, uh, all the speakers of um, this introduction. Douglas, can you leave up your questions? Yes, yes, I'll do that. I mean, my questions are less, much less detailed than Jan's questions, but here they are. Yeah, so as usual, please raise your hand and wave if uh, your question is related to the comment that is being made now. And uh, of course, Steve and Jan, override me at any moment. You know much better who to call next. Otherwise, I'll just follow more or less chronologically. And also the people that I will also call on people that did not uh, participate yet. And uh, by the way, uh, Jan's slides that have many, many, many questions should be uploaded to the website very, very soon, maybe in a few seconds, or maybe they are already there. So, yeah, uh, as I said, let's start with people that did not have a chance to participate yet. So, uh, Greg. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a small comment about one of Jan's questions. Um, another possibly interesting ensemble, he asked um, if there are other ensembles of CFTs one might want to look at. And one possibly interesting one is just products of symmetric products of K3s and T4s. End of comment. 
You mean uh, averaged in terms of averaging those over uh, the moduli, or? Yes, exactly. They have that. They, they have a natural finite measure, finite volume. Measure. So, sorry, but a comment related to that. Uh, is it clear that the that integral is going to converge? Because um, in the Narayan story, it's important that you never, you know, insert more partition functions than the dimension of the of the you know of the lattice that you're integrating over. And in the orbifold theory, be, because basically you have a four-dimensional lattice, but you're going to have n copies. I think you run into the problems, and that may not converge. Well, I think even in the rain case, uh, the experts are here, they can correct me. I thought even in the rain case, you had to deal with some infinities. I don't know. The only thing I thought about was averaging the elliptic genus. And since you have these different components, it was still interesting. That's why I asked the question. I think nobody's looked at this ensemble. Hiroshi? Yeah, so, so I, we have actually looked at the related ensemble, which is just one copy of K3 target. And we have some tentative conjecture that the uh, straightforward generalization of this Narayan ensemble case works only when critical central charge is equal to central charge, which is not the case for these examples. So you're saying that if we take um, products of symmetric products, you're gonna have, and well, you yeah. can take average, but it yeah. may not have straightforward bulk interpretation in terms of a simple gravity, whatever that is. Uh, you are muted, Greg. I'm not sure if you are replying. Uh, I'm not replying. Okay. I have to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so then uh, maybe let's move to uh, Henry. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a simple point that we've, it's, um, there's not really a, a dichotomy between uh, the ensemble from what Douglas calls simple gravity and having a, a unique dual theory or whatever language you want to uh, use. That actually there's, uh, the ensemble is not a property of the, of the theory of gravity uh, by itself, it's a property of the theory of gravity and the state of closed universes. So the state of closed universes gives you a parameter to dial from an ensemble to a single theory. And, and I think that we can probably gain a lot of ground by thinking about what happens when we dial that parameter, when we choose the state of closed universes to be close to an alpha state, which corresponds to a single member of the ensemble. Yeah, I guess my question was, how would you imagine doing a relevant computation, say in AGS 5 cross S5 to test this idea? What would be a precise question to ask? Uh, to test what, sorry, yeah. This dial, how, how could, what would it exactly mean to dial and to choose an alpha vacuum as opposed to following the user rules of AGT? What would be the key difference? So I, I'm thinking about you di dialing the alpha, well, dialing yourself to an alpha state is something you do in, in what Douglas called simple gravity. So simple gravity, if you take this seriously, is describing a, an ensemble dual, if you'd like that language. And so, you know, for example, Hawking's calculation, it gives you a way of saying that Hawking's calculation is correct, but the replicable wormhole calculations of the page curve are also correct. And it, so it puts everything on a, on a, in a coherent footing. And in that theory of simple gravity, the way you would dial to an alpha state is, for example, by creating many black holes and making projective measurements on, uh, on the Hawking radiation. And that's something you can, uh, you can describe explicitly in, uh, in, these, in this simple theory of gravity. It's not, I'm not so much saying whether you, how you distinguish between simple gravity being an ensemble and being a unique theory. I'm saying if simple gravity sits in this ensemble paradigm and you believe that, nonetheless, you can die yourself to a single uh, right, relevance yeah. to the theory. And if you, you think you're true, say n equals four as a, as a particular theory, you might hope that it looks very, very similar to a generic alpha state in the simple gravity theory that describes an ensemble. 
So for example, the statistics within the ensemble at fixed energy would, for the, exactly the reasons you said, that, that it doesn't really matter how you average, that should tell us something about the statistics of microstates in a specific theory. Because the, again, for, the, for all the reasons you, you described. Right, right. So if right, we want yeah. to learn about the statistics of fuzzballs, then we can do that by learning about the statistics of an ensemble in, uh, in simple gravity. Just that's the hope. I see. Yeah, I, I think you're. Um, yeah, I think maybe we're all saying roughly the same thing with slightly different words at the end of the day. I am not exactly sure. Maybe Steve wants to uh, chime in at this point. Uh, okay. I I've had my say, so I've been trying to be quiet. But uh, I guess I guess Henry, I'd ask you. I mean, I think the question maybe is. Do you think that there is such a thing as a gravitational path integral that will compute simple gravity on the nose that will contain all the fuzzballs and uh, everything else, like compute the ensemble average spectral form factor, the exact shape of that red curve in Super Yang Mills? That's, that's the question. I think that's the right question. I don't have a good... Sorry, maybe okay. let, let me ask something because maybe I'm a bit confused by this new language, uh, simple gravity. I, I never heard it before. Sorry. So, in any in any course, for super young meals, simple gravity is the usual one I'm used to, or it's something different. Well, what what is what is the bulk in super young meals? That's kind of the question that we're dancing around. I mean, it's got we know some things about it, but I, I think underlying this, there's somebody that's not muted. I guess uh, is it? I don't know. Uh, and so the question is, uh, is it a sum over metrics? Is it a sum over metrics with a couple of strings on it? Is it a couple of metrics with strings and a bunch of brains? What is it? I see. And uh, uh, so, you know, is there another way of getting the exact shape of the spectral form factor in super Yang Mills other than using the boundary theory? Okay, and I guess Jan was asking what computation should we do in the boundary to answer those kind of questions? Well, let's assume point. that we know the boundary. Let's say we have a very powerful quantum computer and I can draw the exact shape of the spectral form factor. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, just like I can give you that red curve. We sort of, you know, that at least we know the equations to solve even though we can't solve them. Is there another set of equations well posed that if you were powerful enough, Another set that involved different variables that everybody in this quote unquote room would call a different dual description that produces exactly the same curve. And uh, that's, that's, that's the question. And uh, okay. uh, Daniel, do you wanna say- Maybe. What? It, Right, that, well, okay. Uh, Daniel, do you wanna say your thing out loud? Oh, okay, chat. yeah, just so yes, that's the question. But the answer to that question is not what's meant by simple gravity. Simple gravity is the thing that compute, you know, that is the thing where the integral is just over the super gravity fields and, you know, right. fixed up a little bit in some way that we don't exactly well, that, know how to characterize. That's the question. The question is, how does that relate? Is that some, uh, you know, almost alpha state? Is that some sort of uh, blurring? You know, is there some useful notion of being in between? Uh, this mythical thing, well, I don't know if it's mythical, this thing we don't have yet and the thing we know how to compute with. That's, that's, those are the questions. Yeah. Sandeep is Maybe one of it's uh, Julian and Sandeep. I think Sandeep, I saw him first. Maybe Sandeep first and then Julian. Okay. Yeah, that I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to say something quickly to Steve, but then I wanted to come to my question, which is, Steve, let's assume that ADS CFT extends to full uh, closed string type to be string field theory being equivalent to the boundary theory. Then you would have to do the computation of your ramp with all its intricate structure, yeah. presumably. In, in type 2b closed string theory. And as Daniel said, it's not simple gravity, but presumably there you would get the same answer if the duality is correct. That's, would, that, would that last, that's of, of course, that's right. The question is, what is that thing? What is string field theory? And that we don't know what yeah. it is. Uh, Ashok gave, I mean, Barton gave a great summary in which he said all string field theories have been constructed. I know nothing about the subject, but okay. well, I, I, <laughs> Yes, I, 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 I agree. It's very interesting. It's not, you know, I think dealing with black holes is not quite 
there yet. Uh, but that's right. That would be kind of along the line. That you, and the question is, is there a way of kind of, uh, you know, approximating that theory in a way that looks a lot like metrics and wormholes for computing certain things? For instance, suppose you wanted to compute the time average spectral form factor. Could you see that that thing would produce wormholes? Yeah. And the question yeah. is, how does it do it? Yeah. Yeah. And what's the I, first I, correction I, I, to a wormhole that yeah. that equation predicts? Those are the kinds of questions. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Actually, that brings me to the question, if I can ask, which is, um, and Steve already maybe gave a partial answer to this, but is Jan emphasized the fact that sometimes an ensemble average might arise uh, from a theory which is a single Hamiltonian theory, unitary theory, if we did coarse graining over energies, I think is what Jan was saying. But to my mind, and maybe it's a semantics distinction, but I, I, I'm not so sure, uh, when you, I see the ramp with all its very intricate structure being roughly approximated by just the linear growth, isn't it more like a time average being reproduced a coarse grain time average being reproduced by an ensemble average. And the reason I'm asking this is this is something we know very well happens in statistical mechanics. You have a, a closed system with a single Hamiltonian and because it's ergodic with many degrees of freedom, you can reproduce coarse gray, you know, simple correlators through an ensemble average. And maybe that's what's happening in cases where wormholes exist and give a good approximate description. Uh, is this reasonable? Um, the the follow-up to this would be in, in the papers you folks have written where you, for example, look at single instantiations of the SYK model. Um, well, I'm sorry, I haven't fully studied them. What happens? You don't really have uh, any, any effect connecting the two boundaries, but perhaps I think you see the, the wormhole being a good approximation anyway, perhaps because the, the time average is anyway well given through an ensemble average. Sorry, uh, just thought I'd get your comments on this. Maybe you could combine with Julian and then uh, get back to both of you. Yeah, because I think I actually have a similar <clears throat> question, which I phrased slightly technically, it was actually just a small clarification question to Stephen, what is his opinion on this? When you say that it, it, it actually computes exactly the same, say, spectral form factor, <clears throat> Do you mean that it really computes exactly the same points? Or do you mean that it is able to reproduce um, the exact statistics, so all of the moments? I, I mean exactly the same points. That's the, that, that is the, the, the hope that, that you know, many of us grew up on. Uh, well, no, but I mean, okay. that, that, that there is a I, I duality want, want, between CFT and ADS. I want to try and tell you what your hope is, but I mean, being able to characterize just all the statistical properties of the single would already be extremely, uh, would be amazing, I think. Uh, oh, great. All of the statistical but, but... properties, not just its, its mean, and not just its variance and so on. So it's, it's just a different, uh, you know, sample of the same statistical distribution. Well, uh, okay, I, I agree that there could be many middle places along the along the road that would be very interesting. But but uh, Juan, did, I think there was some comment about Juan's in the chat that might be relevant here. Yeah, I think there are many discussions about most, uh, uh, yeah, from Juan, yeah. and okay, yeah. uh, Neil. So, so I yeah. guess there is the idea that perhaps type to be super strength theory in 10 dimensions might not be a unique theory as we normally think it is but might have an ensemble average. So one question we can ask is which, which is the first operator that varies from member to member in the ensemble? Mm -hmm. and there are some simple operators like the R to the fourth term and so on, which uh, we think are completely fixed as people have uh, shown. And I guess what, what is the first one? Is, is the, just the first non-protected operator, non-supersymmetric, Kali protected operator enough or, or should we go to more and more complicated ones? Sorry, let me maybe ask. I could not understand very. So, would you average over what? Over the string coupling? Over? No, I think the the idea is that even the theory for fixed string coupling would be dual to some ensemble, or the, the, 
would be related to some kind of ensemble. And um, I, I think so what you're saying is, is you know, ensemble which can't be eliminated by going to a super selection sector. No, well, it's related to a super selection sector. So, for example, in the philosophy that Henry was proposing, uh, you would access this by forming a black hole and letting it evaporate. I guess you also proposed a similar thing with uh, Folchinsky. And um, the question is, well, that's in principle one proposal for a coupling or a process that would depend on which member in the ensemble you are in. Uh, but which is the simplest process? Is that uh, I mean, we, we know that if we scatter four gravitons and we look at the R to the fourth term, that that is fixed. And but is there some operator further down uh, which is not fixed? And may, maybe we could try to see whether that is somehow fixed uh, through. Anything. Maybe I'm confused by something basic. But those rules of fixing the terms, like we heard in the talk by Ashok and others, aren't they based on a more conventional uh, theories where we don't average and so on? So if you have a non-BPS operator, so if you have a BPS operator or some protected quantity, then you might think it does not fluctuate. It's fixed by uh, by some uh, you know kinematics or something, like the R to the four term in uh, supergravity. But if you take some other piece that's not protected, there's no reason for it to not be sensitive to some some detailed super selection sector. And you could explore whether uh, you know if you can try to find an argument whether it has uh, fluctuates or not. Uh, and if you, that would be the first candidate operator that might fluctuate, I would guess. I guess that's what Juan was saying as well. Yeah, but I think the instantons, instanton correction to D to the um, uh, eight R to the four, for example, can be calculated in principle. Right? I think the Harvard group is already into it, and there doesn't seem to be any non uniqueness in that calculation. Right? That's the, I mean, the standard instanton, if anything. Right, I guess the, I think uh, if you think in terms of ensemble, you would think that the instanton should be a space time instanton, some amplitude of order of one over three string squared, uh, where you have a topology change of the full background space time. Um, well, it's asymptotically flat, right? I mean, it, it's localized in space and time. You are thinking in terms of uh, some. Uh, well, the, those. Are, I mean, I think you are arguing that the effects of order one that go like e to the minus one over g are, are fixed. But yes, I think uh, people who would propose an ensemble would say that the effects should go like one over g squared because they involve uh, some kind of space-time instanton where you change the, the whole geometry of the closed string background. I see. Um, so those will be different kinds of instantons, not the ones that we. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, yeah. I um, well, I have a question. I like Ashok since you just replied. Do you think string field theory, in its current uh, state of development, could say something about black holes? I mean, in principle. I mean, not solving equations, but you know, is it computationally well enough specified to study? Uh, uh, high energy states? No, I think certainly closed string field theory is not in a, in a position to do that. Open string field theory, I think, is much better understood. But, but suppose and, you just collide a couple of open strings, I don't know, you know, and put it in ADS or something, you know, do you think you could make a big black hole that's stable for a long time? Do you think by solving the equations? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's what's trying. I mean, open string okay. field theory. Is a, I mean, it's a well-defined object. Classical open string field theory is a well-defined object. You have a standard mechanism for quantizing the BV, and many classical solutions have been understood, right? So it's possible that by colliding. But you, can can you I, define I can can you define the integration contours for the quantum theory? Can you, you know, compute the, you know, compute it? These are non-perturbative kind of even semi-formal definition that makes sense? That's not just yeah, something over saddle point? I think the D instantons or all Euclidean D brains are reasonably well defined. Yeah, but, but beyond that, things that are- uh, Beyond that, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Exactly, it's, uh, nothing has been done. Okay, but, but you know, that, that's, that's interesting. 
Um, there are some other questions that uh, that we we got to. Uh, where where are, are we? Have, we chat? have we have lots of people raised with yes. raise their hands. I haven't kept track of who's first. Yeah, let's go maybe with uh, uh yeah with Thomas. Yeah, thanks. I I just wanted to um, mention that the, the discussion is quite abstract. So if we go away from JT gravity and since this is a strings conference, try to think of the, you know the higher dimensional examples, which Jan was mentioning. I was wondering what people actually have in mind. So are we talking? I mean. To make it less abstract, which wormholes are we really talking about? Do we always have in mind these constrained instantons? Or is it more like what Maldacena and Maus did? Or actually the original example by Coleman? Because it's Coleman who started this whole discussion about wormholes. Uh, and then the, at least the good thing of the Euclidean axion wormholes is that they are the, the operators that source them are actually, so the, the, the bulk fields are dual to marginal operators. And from the chat box discussion, it seems that people are willing to say that you can actually maybe you know, create an ensemble of, of CFTs by averaging over the conformal manifold. Maybe that can make sense. So I'm wondering, you know, what do people have in mind? I think you kind of need to specify, otherwise the discussion remains super abstract. Yeah, can I say something? So, so my impression is that uh, the rules of the game are not very precise. I think one thing that you can do is you define for yourself a, a low energy effective uh, field theory that you work with, right? Because uh, we don't have the power to construct these things in full string field theory. So you write, you, you use your favorite low energy effective field theory and you decide what the rules are for you. And then with those rules, you can do a computation uh, and there may or may not be a wormhole uh, according to the rules that you're using. And then you need to uh, ask yourself whether that's an artifact of the rules that you're using or whether you think whatever you were computing uh, is reliable and uh, gives some insight the, uh, in the full but, theory. But Jan, can you specify if you tell me Euclidean supergravity, I know what to do? That, that's a particular one. If you can decide that that's the theory that you work with. For example, you could say I'm going to work in a pure gravity or something, right? I'm ignoring everything else, but then that's you know that that's incredibly unreliable because you threw away lots of light matter fields and so on. You could also take like a, you know some Kaluza Klein reduction, or you can take 10D string theory or 10D super gravity on AGS five crosses five. Right? You can I think you can pick pick your low energy factor field theory, try to do a computation, and try to interpret it. But I don't think there are sharp rules at this point. Okay. That, Mihailo? Mihailo uh, uh, So uh, Jan had a question on uh, the role of ensembles for Lorentzian wormholes, but you actually, well, you just glossed over it. So I would love to hear if you can comment on that in particular. I mean, it seems that we normally interpret a Lorentzian traversable wormhole as dual to literally just two two interacting subsystems, so no ensemble, literally two, two systems coupled. But then if it's non-traversable, then it's normally interpreted as a thermophile double. And we usually think of it not as two systems, but as a single system, just with the formal doubling of the degrees of freedom to account for the temperature. So could you comment on that? I mean, how to resolve that? Oh, it, it, this was an invitation for someone to say something insightful, because obviously we have the usual... Uh, Thermophile double situation where, uh, if you want the Einstein Rosen bridge, if you want to call that a Lorentzian yeah. formal is connected to entanglement. So, those things I think we understand quite well. Um, my question was more are there interesting Lorentzian mm. computations that, that tell us something that we have not yet learned from Euclidean computations? And if so, what are those lessons? That was my question. And it was an invitation to everyone listening to say something useful about that question. I just wanted to raise the question. I don't have anything particularly insightful to offer myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Andrea has a comment related to this. Yeah, I think that the distinction between Euclidean and Lorentzian, I'm going to say this again until, uh, is, um, is not as sharp as, as perhaps it's suggested in many of these discussions. The replica wormholes for computing the page curve from a black hole formed from collapse are Lorentzian, or at least can be written in a language that is purely Lorentzian, makes okay. no reference whatsoever to Euclidean. 
yeah, there's there is a, another distinction which is between spatial wormholes, things like the traversable wormholes and the Einstein Rosen Bridge, and space time wormholes, which connect different um, complete boundary components. And that I think is a very important distinction. One is related to entanglement and one is related to ensembles. But the distinction between Euclidean and Lorentzian, I think, is not um, terribly important mm -hmm. at, at a conceptual level. Okay. Ben? Uh, ben Fragable? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention it's, it's very interesting uh, averaging over theories. It seems very hard in higher dimensions. And I, I think an easier thing, especially in the ADS context, is averaging over states. Um, Steve was asking the question about you know, a gravity calculation that could calculate this plateau. Um, and I mean, we showed that like in the ADS CFT context, you can calculate uh, basically the variance uh, of that two-point function average over an ensemble of, of states. And then that becomes just a, a thermal field double calculation that's under control in semi-classical gravity. So basically averaging over states, you know, brings these, it allows you to compute these variances kind of <laughs> along the lines of what you were saying in your, in your talk. And it's sort of more obvious that it makes sense to average over states. Uh, in the higher dimensional case. Do you think averaging over states will smooth out the time dependence in the spectral form factor? Um, well, I mean, the thing that's under control is is you need to average over states in some range of energies and, and that averaging um, will, will smooth out that noise. So you I, can I then ask about- I, I don't see how it will, given that it doesn't change the energy eigenvalues at all. It just changes the size of the fluctuations, but the it'll change. It'll decrease the size of the signal, but I don't see why it'll change. You know why time one is different than time two? That's all about the the, the eigenvalues, and that ravaging over states doesn't change that. But isn't it? Just like Are you asking about whether the noise filter? will be smoothed out in this calculation? Yeah, it's like a low pass filter, depending on how you choose the the window. I think it does kind of filter the signal a bit. I, well, maybe this is too technical. We should go offline. I, I okay. Look, maybe we, we should uh, reserve that then. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. But uh, so there, there are other people. I guess uh, Andy Strominger hasn't had a chance, and he's been waiting a long time. Who else? Uh, Alex Bellin. Yeah, the, Alex said something earlier. Let's go to Andy and then Alex. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, so this is a question. So. What about the possibility, there doesn't seem to have been that much discussion of this, that either the model needs to be modified or the, um, or the use of the Euclidean path integral needs to be modified and in some way, I mean, Euclidean path integrals and in quantum gravity are, of course, notoriously subtle. And that they're just, that all this ensemble average is, is a symptom of having done the calculation wrong or starting with an inconsistent model mm -hmm. and that we need to modify something and then we'll, we'll have a, a nice uh, unitary quantum theory of gravity. Is that possible? Yeah, I, I well, I, I think maybe this is along the line of, uh, was it Douglas's first question or second question about what, is there something you could add to quote unquote simple gravity that sort of, fixes things up and yeah, where things factorize. And, and uh, that, that seems plausible. Uh, this baby example that I talked about uh, where you take uh, SYK, which is a completely well-defined path integral, whatever else it is, you know, these auxiliary fields, you're just integrating over them. And in this toy example, this toy squared example, it's just an ordinary integral. And you find there's a wormhole that has all kinds of problems. It's just, you know, it doesn't factorize and all, but there's this other part of the integration space, you know, that's noisy and restores factorization. You know, it's not clear quite what is geometrical interpretation, but it, it, that seems quite possible that there's a way of doing the integral that gives wormholes plus something else. And uh, that, that, yeah, that, that seems possible. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Alex? Yeah, so one comment or question, something that's not clear to me is, let's take the ensemble averaging 
um, hypothesis seriously for a second. And we, this is sort of related to Juan's question earlier. And we take, say, type 2b supergravity on ADS5 plus S5. And we want to say, okay, that's dual to an ensemble of CFTs. How are we going to make that precise? Because we still need to be solving the bootstrap equations exactly, not approximately. So I don't see how we could ever land on anything else than maybe an average of n equals to four over the, the TOF coupling. Because that, that is the set of data that solves the bootstrap equations non-perturbatively. So I'm not exactly sure how we could ever land on anything else. It's not even obvious for me that averaging over coupling, is it obvious that it's still a solution of the bootstrap? I know it is, it is, of course. I think so, because it's yeah, yeah, every it's single exactly. instance that you summed over satisfies crossing. Yeah, so sorry, sorry, of course. I think that works, but that, as far as I can see, that's the only thing that works. So I, if we really want to take this ensemble average seriously, what else could it be? If you would input... Um low energy information in the bootstrap, including all these error margins. Because as a low energy observer, everything we measure and everything we can compute has error margins. We don't know sharp low energy correlators. We know approximate low energy correlators, right? If you input imprecise information in the bootstrap, could the output not be something different? So then you, what you're saying is you would violate the bootstrap conditions by exponentially small effects. You're going to allow yourself to violate the bootstrap axioms by exponential. Well, I'm effects. putting. I, I, the only thing I know is I have uncertain information to begin with. There's some error margins, and now I'm running the bootstrap program. What is the what is the thing that I get? Uh, I have a suggestion. Let's uh, close here the official part of the informal discussion by thanking. Uh, very much, Douglas, Jan, and Steve for a beautiful uh, discussion. And uh, we have uh, we can unofficially continue for ten more minutes. And uh, but uh, the the official part, the, the one for YouTube, I think I guess we can close it here. Can I get the instruction on how to go to poster session? So I think uh, for poster sessions, um, we will uh, create breakout rooms and then you should just click on the breakout room and choose the room. Okay, so- Oh, so we hey, come then, back to this uh, Zoom there? meeting. It, it will be on this Zoom meeting and uh, we will put a, a page on the screen with the various rooms and the names of people. And people will just be able to click on the button that says breakout rooms and choose which room they want to go to. There can be six people at each room and you can just move around in the various rooms, including people that are giving the posters. They can also move to other rooms to check other posters and then come back when they see someone in their room. So you can see who is in the various rooms and we will have 50 rooms. So, yeah. Thank you. Maybe I can make a comment related to Alex's question just now. Um, I feel like the state of the art in terms of our understanding of the bulk theory dual to n equals four super young mills is not enough to describe exactly n equals four super young mills. So when we talk about the bulk theory, we shouldn't be trying to get an answer that exactly solves the bootstrap. I think what our current understanding of the bulk theory is good enough to do is good enough to compute boundary observables that are consistent with some kind of formal ensemble, which is similar to n equals four super young mills. And it's not completely well-defined. Uh, so we shouldn't try to compare it to the exact bootstrap equations. In order to, to do that, we need to understand the bulk theory better. Yeah, I completely agree. But, but that in some sense then says that we're not trying to make very sharp the notion. So we have a very sharp notion of saying, go from the CFT, which is non-perturbatively defined n equals to four. And that predicts what we should, everything, every single thing we should compute in the bulk. We may not be capable of doing that and we don't really know the rules, but that, that, that direction is well-defined. But the other direction seems very murky. And so it's not clear to me that you could ever try to make precise what you mean by semi-classical gravity is dual to something else. Like that, that direction of the arrow seems Blur blurry at best to me. Yes. 
I think uh, Henry and Tom Mark? and Mark wanted Maybe to Mark? come in. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I was just wondering, I mean, with with maximal supersymmetry, uh, it, it seems, so I guess the idea is that there, there could be some simple version of, of type 2b string theory, which is not, uh, which is, which is the thing that would be dual to whatever <laughs> ensemble we have in mind, but it, um, maybe people, some, someone that is an expert on these um, just constraining effective actions with, with maximal supersymmetry could comment. I, I mean, it seems like there's not much freedom or is the idea that the, uh, the simple version would have less symmetry somehow? Is it possible there's an ambiguity in the large end limit? Some subtle differences in how you take it? Maybe a related question is, uh, there are many localization results, say, that are computed for, may, for any n, and can we use them to test some of these uh, ideas? Well, maybe a comment about that is that often these are used to compute things like indices, like the BPS index or something like that. And that's, I think, sort of precisely where we don't want to look, because those are very special states. And we're really trying to ask about quantum chaos and sort of the generic states. And so it, it might be very tricky to, to, to look along the axis of things like, you know, an elliptic genus or, or, or something that counts BPS states. Let, let me make a comment just uh, since it's a discussion, it's informal and you're not being recorded, that just as an example of the uh, of fantasy you might have, you know, as people know, an example of a, of a given fixed beautiful system like super Yang mills is the Riemann zeta function. And the zeros of the Riemann zeta function are in some sense analogous to energy eigenvalues. And they're just numbers that you can compute. They're once and for all, like super Yang mills energy levels. And there's this completely other way of computing the Riemann zeta function. Well, it's actually the only way, which, you know, by summing over primes or taking the product over primes. But there's something like wormholes in these semi-classical chaos things, which is, uh, you know, uh, Montgomery showed that there's a ramp in the zero, in the statistical distribution of the zeros. They look like random matrix theory. And the style of argument is very much like coarse graining and getting what's called the diagonal approximation. That looks like a wormhole. But I think maybe Douglas had mentioned the idea of an approximate solution to the bootstrap in some informal discussion and I just decided to go cruising the literature. It turns out some proof techniques that mathematicians use to prove things about uh, the statistical distribution of zeros involves the notion of constructing approximate solutions to the functional equation that the Riemann zeta function obeys, which is the analog of modular invariance. It's part of a bootstrap thing. And they look for approximate solutions and approximate, families of approximate solutions, and then they average over them. And they use this to try to establish uh, precise results about uh, the kinds of statistical things that we're talking about, products of partition functions or maybe products of uh, maybe the ter spectral determinants in our language. But so this notion is not, you know, it's not just, you know, uh, crazy. Well, maybe it's crazy, but uh, at least in some rather well-posed example, it's led to precise results. Uh, and I'll try to dig up a, a reference. Yeah, and I'll put yeah, it in the chat. Ask, yeah. I was going to ask. Yeah. Uh, I, I spent a little time with a student trying to make sense of it. I couldn't, but I'm... I'm not the right person to do it. Uh, but as long as you don't say you're working in the Riemann hypothesis, it's okay. Yeah, I, I am not saying that. Uh, but uh, okay, yeah, I'll I'll put a reference in the chat. Maybe, maybe right, maybe I don't know what where the interchange will go. All right, maybe I'll put it. I'll put it. She, maybe you had many comments in the chat. Maybe it would be nice. To... Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment on. Uh, Actually, Douglas was uh, mentioning this earlier. Uh, I want to sharpen kind of the question of what is it uh, that we want to uh, compute from the bulk um, to, to pin down ankle sports supremus, let's say. 
Uh, and I think we should separate things that are uh, that we know we can currently you know get exclusive answer for versus uh, things that can in principle be calculated in the sense that we have an algorithm for. And I would say that so from bootstrap perspective, we think that if we can pin down the list of operator scaling dimension, uh, you know, of uh, of uh, operators in equals four supremos, uh, then the theory will be will be completely determined. And and um, and that data, for instance. Um, uh, in principle, from the bulk, uh, we think there are all the ingredients to do a complete um, series expansion in one over n, at least perturbing in one over n, but to all the others, because that that that's um, that's in principle determined by the, you know perturbative clustering field theory, if you wish. Um, the, of course, in, in practice, it's still a very tough problem, but in principle, the algorithm is all there, just you know, a matter of computational power. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, to me, the the question is. Uh, from this perspective, you know, if you, if, you know, given what we know about uh, the way we define type two D three theory, a is five times ten to five. The the the, the question really is, um, how do you go beyond the, the perturbative uh, series in one over n? Um, and uh, and then you know there are, you know, we can discuss e to the minus n effects and e to the minus n, n square effects. Um, so I think one can kind of corner down our ignorance to um, you know specific non-perturbative uh, corrections in, in one over n I would like to pin down. I'm, I'm not saying that you know we, we th that part can be determined from what we know about the bulk, the bulk, but I think the question can be sharpened. I think Andre has a comment precisely related to this. It yeah, and related to this this discussion. I mean, it's just, if we suppose we were all powerful and could do what you suggest and compute everything we wanted order by order in an asymptotic expansion in one over n, plus including some instance on corrections if we wanted, but all we have access to is this asymptotic expansion plus instance on corrections, then if we wanted to compute something like a spectral form factor, which we expect to depend, I think, very erratically on n, what's the best that we could hope for if we only have access to an asymptotic expansion? I don't really know what the answer to that question is, but the answer might be the asymptotic expansion gives us an excellent approximation to statistics instead. Alex? But the procedure you're proposing, she would not allow us to compute the scaling dimensions of operator of order n squared, right? They would enable us to compute the scaling dimension of all operators for, whose conformal dimension is fixed in the large n limit. I think. Do, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. A priori, yes. I, and I, and I agree with that. and this is really what we're asking about. So I don't know how this relates to Henry's question. I don't know if you know, uh, like. Uh, well, okay, but, but sorry, I actually would would uh, turn this around slightly because. Uh, it, it depends on how accurately you can determine the operator of dimension of order one. Okay. Uh, I mean, in principle, <laughs> you know, we will believe that uh, if you can pin down, you know, to arbitrary accuracy for n equals five, uh, we will be able to bootstrap everything given that uh, data. Um, but uh, so, 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 uh, uh, you, you know, we are, we are ignorant both about, uh, you know, uh, operator spectrum at the dimension order n square, as well as various small corrections to operators of dimension one. Uh, I'm not sure which one is the, the best thing to, to tackle from the bulk perspective, but I'm saying, yeah. Right. But wouldn't you, wouldn't she, wouldn't you have to know, like, you know, the contribution of vertical, of virtual heavy pairs of black holes to matrix elements of light operators to... Uh, yes, but that's not a contradiction with what I'm saying, because uh, indeed we do not know how to, or at least it's not, there's no algorithm to determine e to the minus n squared or the correction to... The Konishi operator is getting dimension. Right. So, so yeah. I mean, right. So, yes, it's true. It will infect low dimension operators, but by very small amounts that seem hard to compute. Right. Uh, uh, you know, from, from the at least from the bootstrap perspective, in trying to solve conformal data of a CFT, let's say a given value of n equals yeah. three or something. Um, in practice, that that is the kind of approach we we do try to determine the low dimension, low lying operator dimension as accurately as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it doesn't give you everything, but, but we think, you know, it gives you a lot. And, uh, you know, it, um, and if you make it arbitrary precise, we believe that uh, you will pin down the theory eventually. So uh, 
may, may not be the most efficient uh, way to, to, you know, access the, the data you, you want. Uh, I would suggest that uh, this uh, we could continue on Slack. I think it will be fun to have more uh, discussion there and further suggestions on how to proceed. But uh, right now uh, we have to test the breakout rooms. So let's please uh, thank uh, once again, uh, um, Douglas, Steve and Jan for uh, the formal and the informal part of the informal discussion. And uh, let's set up the posters and please check out the many, very, very many posters. All right. Thank, thanks to you, Pedro, for, for doing such a good job. Uh, <laughs> you did everything.